Yeah. You might know it was in Seville. Uh, no, Seville, Madrid. Mm. We were Madrid and we were doing a bit of voice before the game. You know, we these Celtic porters outside, obviously in the, in the museum and all that, and we're chatting away and saying, struggling for tickets. You know, we, we've been told if we go into the Madrid end, we're going to get arrested. And we went, oh, well, we'll catch us later. So we come back at night, <laughs> we're waiting in the queue. There's a boy with a big sombrero and a Mexican. <laughs> We're looking at them going, see, si, senor? <laughs> you do anything. You do anything to get it. I'm not sure I could get into the opposition in the alley. That'd be a hard call, wouldn't it? So I did a quick kind of cinematic pan of the room, and there's no grace. I thought, where the hell is she? So a security guy waves me over. He's standing at the bathroom door, and he said, uh, she's having a bath. You're going to have to interview her when she's in the bath. And I thought, I, I, I kept waiting for the punchline. <laughs> And there wasn't a punchline. Yeah. And I went, are you sure about this? He went, absolutely. So he takes me in and there's Grace Jones lying in the bath. So she's lying all covered in soap suds, a bit like when you saw Joan Collins in Dynasty. She was sort of yeah. hiding her modesty underneath a cloud of soap suds. And I never had any time for any niceties. I just had to get in and steam in. Yeah. What, into the bath? No, I didn't get in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get into the bath or there was a, a, a flood in, in, in Milan. <laughs> So I just sat down. You think I'm making this up? I sat down on the toilet seat. Aye. I put my tape machine in the B day. I pressed play and record, and I was as close as Grace Jones as I'm to you. And I interviewed Grace Jones for the next twenty minutes in the bath. So it ended. Like her. Oh, I love her. I'm a huge fan. And then, of course, you know, soap suds are made of bubbles, and bubbles dissolve. So she got the sort of shower head and kind of fluffed them up again. But then she just didn't bother. And she's lying there completely and utterly as you do when you're having yeah. a bath, lying totally bollock naked. Yeah. And she's a beautiful, beautiful woman. She still is. But there was lots of eye contact because, you know, I'm having to... Because yeah. I don't want to stare down for obvious reasons. Yeah. And, and she was great. So at the very end of it, I thought, people are not going to believe this. I said, can I get a photograph? <laughs> expecting the... Expecting the... Um, the, the publicity the, photograph. No, <laughs> expecting the, 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 the security guy to grab me and haul me out. So I've got this great photograph, which I'm happy to send you for the programme if you, if you want it. <laughs> of Grace Jones lying at the bath, uh, giving me a cuddle all covered in soap suds, and I'm oh. sitting in the toilet. Do we slip dates for the part-time teams on a Sunday? Mm. And all the slip dates are midweek. Like, for example, they offered us the Wednesday night away to Peterhead, but that didn't suit us either. And then because Cove, Aberdeen used Cove's pitch, we couldn't get it for the Thursday night, so we're now having to travel to the Aberdeen's training ground for a quarter past seven because the floodlights need to go off at nine o'clock. Mm. I've been on the phone to head teachers at schools to try and get one of my teachers out of their last fifth and sixth period at school. I've got firefighters, I've got nurses. See right now, I've not got a squad for it. You know, d during the game, uh, you shut all the noise out. I can remember it was I can remember it was a bank holiday weekend, uh, and I'd been to to a sport in Hamilton and I'd been for a sauna and been for a bit of breakfast because it was an evening kickoff and we were coming back home and I could see everybody sitting in grass bankings and drinking and you know uh, and uh, I had a wee thing in the back of my mind saying this is dynamite probably yeah uh, because although although it wasn't the day that Rangers so I think it was the day that Rangers could win the league but the point difference was quite quite a bit I yeah. think uh, it meant that Celtic couldn't catch them any, any longer. Yeah. I treated it like a normal game. You know, you, you, you still go into it, you're aware of the players and you, who you want to speak to. You talk to the captains, get the captains to talk to the troublemakers and the way you used to toss a coin sometimes and you would maybe talk to a Peter Grant and say, Peter, I need your help today. I can't kind of get through this. Ian Ferguson at Rangers, these guys. Uh, and you try to buy, buy into, you know, get them to help you with the players. Yeah. Uh, and that day I didn't really feel anything in the game. Of course then you had the coin incident, uh, you got to half time, I think the game finished 3-0 and it wasn't until you got home that then you started to get a sense of watching the news and watching maybe some fighting that was going on in the streets through the news channels. Yeah. But Were you not know, scared when you get hit with the coin? <sighs> I've never been hit with a coin like that before. Yeah. It was quite a strange, a sort of dull you know, feeling. Uh, but the only thing in my mind was to get that game restarted. Yeah. And that was the only thing that was in my mind. It was, you know, a lot of countries, the game would have been stopped, finished, abandoned. Yeah. Uh, that never entered my mind for sure because 
the security issues with that, that you've got to get 60,000 people out onto the streets, you know, without the police knowing gates been opened. And so that, that never entered, you know, our mind. That, uh, but we got to half time, the Celtic dock uh, stitched up the cut. And, you know, I remember, I remember him coming in with the smelling salts, you know, and uh, the fourth official was John Robotham, and John grabbed the smelling salts. And I said, John, they're for me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he was a bit worried that he maybe need to take over. Uh, but again, we get the, the Celtic general manager uh, came in that day, McDonald. Uh, yeah. Alan. Alan McDonald, he found him was okay out for the second half. You know? Yeah. This one is a little bit more subjective. Top five Brits who've played abroad uh, in the history of the game. I've got five mm -hmm. that I think are the top five, mm -hmm. and then you can displace them at your uh, leisure. Um, Gareth Bale. Mm -hmm. Steve McManaman, Ew, huh? John Charles, Paul Lambert, Kevin Keegan. That's good. So there's there's the five that I think are the top five, unless you want to tell me someone else that can come in there that you've witnessed who you think is is more worthy because of their contribution. And I give you, um, you know, Sean... Sean well... It, 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 <coughs> Beckham's a great argument. Mm -hmm. One league title for Real Madrid, mm -hmm. um, Paris Saint Germain, and then AC Milan as well. It's a great point. You're not winning a title with PSG as well? That's Paris Saint Germain, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he's a good and, shout. And also, they're talking about a broad early galaxy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a great shout. I mean, does he, does he get in the top five? I think it's a strong top five, you got, yeah. actually. I'm, is, I, I, yeah. I don't usually agree with you, and I'm a bit devastated. <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> devastated by this. But that, 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 I forgot about yeah. McManaman, which is... I forgot about McManaman, too. Steve, yeah. Steve yeah. 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 against yeah. Valencia. So, yeah. I mean, he, and by the way, uh, uh, the, one of the best books that, I, that, that I've read was his book, Four Years in Madrid. Mm. It was all about him being shunted so far out yeah. and he just would not tolerate it. He wouldn't mm. give up. I know. He dug his heels in and thought, no, no, you're not getting me out that easy. Uh, you know? Uh, I'm just trying to, trying to think of it. Wilkins had a decent career. Well, I'll, I'll be fair to you. I'll, I'll, give you the, no, I'll give you some of the names that are there. Um, I mean, Bradley Wright, Phillips and Tammy Abraham, Ashley Young. Laurie uh, Cunningham had Chris they? Smalling. Yeah. Uh, Laurie Cunningham, Ray Wilkins, mm. Paul Gascoigne, yep. uh, Steve Archibald, Mark Haitley, um, and you also have uh, Paul Ince, Graham Souness, Jude Bellingham, Trevor Francis, um, to name but a few. Chris Waddle, Gary Lineker. Mm, yeah. uh, let's Gary Lineker, I think, would be deserving of... They're uh, all worthy of a mention. Bellingham's going to be... Glenn number, Hoddle. Uh, Bellingham's going to be number one in the list. Yeah. He's going to be it. David and, Platt. Uh, he's... Uh, uh, trying to think of anybody else. Uh, you mentioned Gareth Bale, uh, Chris Waddle, mm -hmm. who uh, was you're voted the second you're greatest. You're yeah, he was go to, voted the second greatest ever Marseille player. Yeah, behind. Um, that's, a good, that's a good point. I think it might. I think it might be somebody like that. But uh, for Falkirk as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jean Pierre Papin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So there you are. Um, any other ones that you can think of? I think that's not a bad. I'm just going to give you one to give you the, the anecdote I told you earlier about uh, a mate of mine, Ali Dick. Yeah. He played for the Ajax and he won our European Cup Winners Cup medal. But he gets in the list only because he was once asked what was the, the best front three he'd played in. And he said, I played with Bergkamp, Van Basten and Dick. That was the front three. And I think that's not a bad. If you're going to put that in your, your gravestone, that was the front three he played in uh, when yeah. he was at Ajax. And yet, strangely enough, and, and I know we joke about it, but Ali Dick is not at the forefront of anybody when they think of Scottish players who have he's achieved got, something. He's got three European medals. Yeah. And that's three more than John Collins, uh, who yeah. went to Monaco as well. You know, so... There's a few Brits over there. Any that you can think of, you and that you think are worthy of a? No, not. not we we, we haven't mentioned Lambert, didn't we? No, we did, yeah. yeah. Lambert's, but, Lambert's, yeah. But Lambert's, I think, was the most incredible of Aye. the five yeah. in your shortlist. Yeah. Because he was at Motherwell. He was a free agent. He couldn't find a club. He was writing to clubs mm -hmm. yeah. and getting nowhere. And they remembered him from having played against them in the UEFA Cup at Fair Park and in the Westphalian. Took a chance for him, and not only does he win the Champions League, but he's man of the match in the final when he's man marking Zidane and doesn't give him a kick. Mm. Yeah. So, and he was there for such a short time. Yeah. To, to be there for such a short time and have such One a season. successful. One a bit, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I, I also must mention to you, um, because I, I just think you, 
I thought he was a wonderful player, uh, Steve Archibald, on the basis that yeah. Archibald. when Terry Venables went there and the sad passing of Terry Venables, he guided Barcelona to their first league title in a long time. Eleven years, mm. you know, with. Uh, Mark Hughes and Lineker there, but Archibald had to pick up the Maradona top and wear the number 10. That tells you a lot about the guy's strength of mind as well. I mean, that just says he just he just takes it and puts it on his back. And you see, it's like that Fergie thing. Fergie always used to try and take players out into an empty Old Trafford to see when they signed them, just to see how they reacted mm. to an empty Old Trafford if they were overawed. And Cantona went out and, to, and Fergie said to him, what do you think this stadium is like for you? And he says, is it big enough for Cantona? <laughs> <laughs> Sums it up brilliantly. Although it's all about, it is all about levels and whether you can handle it. I did say to Steve Archibald one day, Steve, is it true that you took uh, Paul Kane and John Collins and all the trainees mm. in the back of your Rolls Royce to training at Wardy? <laughs> and he went, yes. As if, the, as if I was asking an impertinent <laughs> question. What's wrong with taking the boys to training you, in a Rolls Royce? You really, at the top level, you really need that, don't you? You need mm. that belief. Yeah. I'm the one. Absolutely. We've all had that at one time no. or another and been shot down in flames. <laughs> anyway. Then out front, welded to the microphone stand, was a guy who I'd never seen before, Jim Kerr. Now, he had kind of a page boy, quite a severe page boy haircut. He had the tight black jeans, the winkle picker boots, and he had a priest's, black priest's frock coat that a clergyman would wear yeah. that he bought from Paddy's Market. And he just looked so ill at ease. I, I was going to say he looked like a, a rabbit in a car headlights, but that would suggest fear. There wasn't any fear. Yeah. But he just looked as if he wanted to be anywhere else than standing in front of that microphone in front of 500 people and looking at the back looking at the back wall. And he was, he was just like no guy I'd ever seen. He, was, he didn't look like anybody I knew at school. He didn't you know, look like anybody I knew uh, in, in the football team, anybody I knew in the street. He, he almost looked as if he'd been beamed in from another planet. So what you've got is a situation where frame by frame is slowed down. That influences the referee. And you've also got somebody giving him chapter and verse in his ear. He's obviously made a decision or he hasn't seen a decision, so he then has to go and get this frame-by-frame -frame analysis, this forensic dismantling of a situation, which as many people have said, depending on what angle you're looking at it, suddenly the evidence could be damning and the referees get no option. Then you've got the pressure of the people watching them saying, you blow this, you're in big trouble. So the pressure is incredible, but it's the, it's the interpretation of it. If he's pulled, same as Jersey, he's pulled a penalty. So, but as Neil said, right across the board now, pull the jersey, penalty, free kick, you name it, foul. Middle of the park, pull his jersey, foul. We, we, we have yeah. this conversation every week now, Ruffy, about Rangers getting penalties. <coughs> when are the opposition going to learn? You can't do it. So yeah. Hearts did it, Aberdeen did it, now Dundee have done it. They've given away a penalty for shirt pulling against Rangers. You've got to stop the shirt pulling. I'm yeah. sorry, you have to do it. I know, I know it's a wee while ago since we watched it. I'll, I'll have another look at it. And I, I'm, I'm now coming to the decision. I, I don't think he was defending his face for the ball. Have you changed your mind? Yeah, I have. I think his arms was higher. I say it wasn't a penalty. Uh, I, I, once I got that, the, the. Well, there's the picture. Once I got I mean, the, I don't think he was protecting his face. Now, I think he's put his hands up as an actual reaction. So for me, it's a penalty. You know, I don't agree. Have you changed? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from Monday. Yeah, to the I've, Monday I, I, I've another angle. I keep another, another angle. No, I keep looking at the photograph all the time. I keep looking at it, and then we go to the definitive for this. This, if it, this, if he's saying, if you put your hands up to protect your face, yeah. it's not a penalty. I don't think he was protecting his face. I think it was just an actual reaction. His hand was yeah. up there because if you're protecting your face, you're going like that, right against your. Yeah. Right against your face. Let me do that. Hold on. Or that. Hold yeah. on. Hold on. It's Friday. Yeah. He's, he, it's a full 180, isn't it? Well, we've been, I mean, honestly, it, we've been talking about it every day. By the way, day, uh, the, the, boy that didn't let, but the boy that thought you were murdered, Des, tell Ruffy to go and take a flight. <laughs> no, I didn't say that, but he should. <laughs> I remember, you know, McNee, I mean, McNee yeah, was Jerry. ruthless. Jerry was absolutely in there, you know, and him and Davy Proven used to say to me, if you're writing a column, make sure you say something, but make sure you can stare the person in the eye the next day Aye. And, and stick by what your belief is and don't try and just throw grenades for any sake. And it stuck with me in my head consistently when I was at the Times. I never did that, Peter. I was a shy back. <laughs> 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 so so I, I managed to get round other ways and I, 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 
I had very few confrontations. Alec Ferguson didn't speak to me for 16 years, and this was a guy, you know, kick a ball about with him when he was manager at Murnau, became quite power with him. He never spoke to you for 16 yeah. years? Basically, when we went to World Cup uh, in 1986 to Mexico, uh, and well, what a trip that was, you know, there was the two weeks in Santa Fe, then Los Angeles, and then we, we went to the World Cup. Yeah. And I was, so I'm working for the Glasgow Evening, the Evening Times, which was produced 11 of the happiest years of my life. And... Um, Alec was, was we, we, the first game we got to Mexico, we asked him to give us a team for the Denmark game. Uh, and, and he gave us a team, so we, uh, I don't know if we published it, I can't remember now, but anyway, second game, that was the, the Denmark game, the first game we drew, didn't we? And then the second game, uh, we, for, we asked him for the team, for the Germany game, and he said, no, I'm not, I'm not giving you a team ahead of it because one of, you, one of you lot, Scottish press, leaked it to the Danish ma manager. I think it was Martin Olsen, was it? Yeah. Anyway, he, he didn't do that. So anyway, the trip went on, the World Cup. I was playing trivial pursuits with him on the way back in the plane. Uh -huh. um, with Alec? I mean, the four of us playing in the, the long flight across the Atlantic coming back. And that's, you know, was, and then we got home and decided at the start of the next season, was, he, he, Alec Guthrie, who worked in the Evening Express in Aberdeen, he went to see him and Fergie told Alec, actually accused, he said, who, who liked that team? It was Chit Young, and and I had be, on the basis that I had been out in Denmark doing a, a three day series with Martin Olsen ahead of the game before we went across the Atlantic. I, I didn't quite nonsense, so I went asked to see him. He wouldn't see me. I tried, every time there was a Rangers or Celtic, I was going up to Pataudry. Wouldn't see me. Wouldn't have any do with me. Eventually, he goes to Manchester, um, and he's and I'm trying to get a just blank with press conferences and all that. And I said that was then in two thousand and two, ahead of the. Europe, the Champions League final coming to um, Hamden, I was thrown in an environment with him at St Chambers because I was talking to Willie Miller and he came up and he just sort of, <laughs> all right, check how you get on. As if nothing had happened. nothing had happened. I'm not in a position to do that, that, that stage to say, hey, what happened for the last 16 years? <laughs> but that was how I, I mean, he just, he was, he, he, I mean, you cannot take away from what he's achieved, but... Uh, and, and then I went to a couple of things that all oh, and they couldn't have been nicer. The stories come out that we could be uh, trying out a 10 minute sin bin for cynical fouls and dissent. Well, Jim Craig from the Lisbon Lions has been advocating this for years now. And his reasoning is that it's better to be punished immediately for the sin you've committed rather than wait three or four weeks for it, if it's a yellow card, for example. Um, and, or a red card even, and then... Did he say it like that? Because it sounds almost biblical. Because <laughs> uh, then you've been punished in the, the game you've committed the offence in rather than you know, losing it out later on. And the other team that you've committed the offence against gets the advantage of that. Um, Are you for it? No. And for the, for the very good reason that um, I think their officials are so poor that... I mean, we've seen with VAR, which yeah. has only made three mistakes all season, apparently. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, seen with VAR, how I think it's underlined how poor our officials are in the VAR room and on the pitch. So you're, you're saying it's creating another layer of I mistakes. Think, exactly, and I think it will lead to mayhem if they bring it in. Who scored the only goal for Aberdeen against Frankfurt on Thursday night? Oh, I don't know his name. Uh, Miofsky set it up. Uh, I don't know Aberdeen, hold on. Come uh, on. Does it give me a P? It does. Postal off or something? <laughs> Is that near? <laughs> <laughs> no, it says nah. What? What is it? Oh, no, I give it, I give in. Dante Povara. Oh, P! I wouldn't have got that. 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 And I wouldn't have been shouting for a point if I said P. No, either. no, a chance, right. But the first old firm game was, was, was very, very special. And Hoy Donk had been cautioned that day for a challenge or something. And when he scored one of the equalising goals, he launched himself into the Celtic end, yeah. which is a yellow card. Uh, and I was aware it was a yellow card and I thought no no if there's a supervisor going to criticise me then too bad there's no way I'm going to caution a player for celebrating a goal here yeah. you know so in a sense somebody would be somebody will be jumping at the, at the telly right now going well wait a minute you should have stuck oh, to the letter of the law absolutely but, but is there, was, there, was there more of a was there more of a, a kind of a leeway towards let the referee show a bit of common sense well 18 you know I mean, it's an old firm game if it, had, if it had been maybe two smaller clubs and it was maybe his first yellow card uh, so anyway I, 
at the end of the game, I always remember uh, the General Secretary of Rangers coming in after the game, I think it was Campbell Ogilvy, and he came in and he says, uh, thanks very much for no giving a second yellow card to the Celtic player. And I looked at him, I thought, what? He went, there's been a riot in here. He says, really, common sense was, you know, prevailed. I went, all right, okay, fine, thanks. And when he closed the door, I went, I hope the SFA <laughs> think the same thing, <laughs> you know, when they came in, uh, yeah. because I was unsure. Uh, let's talk about my favourite player, um, Neil Lennon, because he's going to get a lifetime achievement He's my favourite player too. Yeah, is he? Oh yeah, he was my hero growing up. Yeah, same here. Uh, have you got a kind of leash room in your house? I don't actually know. You really need yeah, to get a, your don't. finger out. Uh, can you get it I don't past have anybody? a Neil Lennon room in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, he's a lovable guy. Real, real nice guy. And a bit like you, having, having met him a couple of times and been in the opposite technical area. Um, really nice guy. Knows his stuff. Got Celtic playing tremendous, um, in tremendous fashion won the treble um, we've got a mutual friend actually when we had them at um, when we played them at Hearts at home I gave him a bottle of whiskey and he, and he thanked me for that so I, I hear he likes his he likes his whiskey as well um, tremendous guy I, I really hope that Spurs go and win a trophy I really do for, for him um, and it'll be good for Scottish football as well after having him in, uh, up here of the scenes you're in We've talked about them, they're absolutely brilliant. W were there scenes with the guys that you looked upon that they did that you thought, oh, I can't love that, that's great? Well, funny, the first one that comes to mind is the opposite of that. I remember us sitting down the read through and it says, it's a sketch, the boys are reading it and it says, uh, exterior shot, lighthouse, 1826 or something, blah, blah, blah. And then interior shot, like, first lighthouse keeper is reading a book. Gets to the end of the book and the last page is missing turns to the second lighthouse keeper who's eaten the last page of the book and says, go in and do that. <laughs> second lighthouse keeper says, how? First lighthouse keeper says, just go in and know. And they read that and I was like, that's pish. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish. And they were like, I know, well, no, it'll be all right. We're getting dressed up. And I was like, good luck with that. I mean, it was the biggest catchphrase out of it all. Absolutely. So there's for the ad Famous Tam McManus Derby. That's twice was. you've said that. You said you were the best reporter on. I've got, I've got. He, 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 he never. It was. It wasn't. Maybe they laughed the first time. All the time. <laughs> 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 I'm not coming back. <laughs> oh, I jinxed all over it. Yeah. Well, he missed feet. He missed feet the ground. <laughs> but is there a game where you played in, and you just you you can hear the fans, and you're thinking. We could be on a doing here. Has there ever been a game where you've been in it and you're thinking, oh. Intimid intimidated? Well, not only intimidated, but the way the game was going, you thought, oh, we could be getting leathered here. Quite a few games. <laughs> <laughs> was there a character that you actually enjoyed? You know, sometimes in life, you know, you get, you do a job and you think, God, I'm getting paid to enjoy myself here. Right. What, what was, was there one that stood out for you? Uh, there's loads of them, but the, I think, the one I feel most connection with is the teacher. Aye. Because of a few reasons. A, that was my impersonation of my biology teacher. That was based on a real person. So that was, my old biology teacher was called Mrs Monroe. That was her. And I've been doing impersonations there, out the back, <laughs> loving a fag, at the age of 12, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, I was in the day and she was like, oh, right, Karen, you so I'm doing that in my school pals and when we were, uh, you know, doing this, the series of Tune of Fantasies, have you got any characters? I says, I had an old teacher and I told him, and see that, the reproduction sketch? Yeah. That's, apart from the purple crayon at the end, <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Yeah. Was we went in and she was sweating bullets, man. She was just all over the place and, you know, it was like, miss, what is that? You know, it was a diagram of Willie. What is that, miss? She like, well, Karin Dunbar. <laughs> I am I not surprised that you're asking that when there's when you don't even know who your father is? <laughs> but yeah, I remember talking to an agent in the summertime about a Manchester City player, Celtic or Winter, I can't remember the name. And I said, there's any chance if we come up here? He says, Well, we've got thirty five offers. Right. So you know, every club That'd be the right. midfielder, wouldn't it? Yeah. Tommy McIntyre or something. That's the one. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. You know, you know, these players are in huge demand where you can get them to come to Scotland, at least if there is dual ownership and the owner of Bournemouth is saying, well, you are going to Scotland, there's yeah. a chance you'll get them. But dual ownership could also mean that the owner of Bournemouth has actually got another club and he's going to put money into it. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, he, I mean, it's not just about being a feeder, here's Bournemouth players that are not getting a game. He, if he buys into Hibs, 
and, he, and he's got a stake in the club, he may well bring revenue well, he that said, allows he him said to go he, and... He, he unveiled, he's, he's just, uh, Foley is just purchased a club, set up a franchise in New Zealand, Auckland. Yeah. They're going to play in the Australian A-League. And he went to do a press conference there and he said, well, you know, I'm looking at investments in Holland and in Scotland. We could take players in New Zealand, send them to Scotland. It will be a kind of food chain if you like yes well so you know you might get a couple of new zealanders and they might not mm. work out so well but it'll be a try and buy second who's currently the league's top goal scorer for you for, uh, <laughs> hashi you're <laughs> hashi <laughs> yogo <laughs> yogo <laughs> i think you should get the point taken off him for that pronunciation <laughs> by I'm not saying his name back to front <laughs> i mean i've been single for about five years right and i'm desperate <laughs> <laughs> You're gagging on it. Lassies, I'm, de I'm desperate. Uh, I said, de it's no that like, there's no that level of desperation. But what it is is, I don't, where am I going? What am I doing? Because like, right, I've n I've never been on the apps, and one of my pals says, go on the apps. I went, oh come on, what am yeah. I doing? Putting a photo of myself on it, and when it says occupation, I'm like, well, you might know me. Yeah. Because no, everybody does. <laughs> obviously, you might. I says, and then what if? Like two wee boys are on the apps faffing about and they're like that. Yeah. Oh my god, there's that old woman that my dad likes. <laughs> One wheel kid on with a lazy yeah. and make and I'm sitting in Sanino's, do yeah. you know what I mean? Eating breadsticks, waiting for Denise to turn up at eight o'clock that's half past nine, there's two wee boys looking in the corner. No, uh -huh. so I'm known. So I've need the apps. Um I got asked to it a couple of times, but it just it's didn't not, connect. Not right. yeah. Um and I'm no out. Don't, I don't really go out on the set. I, I, went, I went and DJed because I've been DJing. I went and DJed a night in the Polo Lounge, which was brilliant. It was great. And folk were loving it. And there was quite a bit of attention from children. Yes. In their 20s. Too young. <laughs> okay. I mean, they're no children, do you know what I mean? But yeah. I'm like, 20. Wait a minute. Nah, it doesn't nah, nah. hamper Warren Beatty or something. Nah, I'm no Warren Beatty. Oh, okay, right. Nah. I mean, that's just no... <coughs> I'm not, I'm like a, an intellectual equal, which will be hard. Right. <laughs> the more games you win, the more confidence it breeds and the more players believe in what you're doing. But if you're playing brilliant football and losing 4-3 every week, all of a sudden the chairman goes, <laughs> can we get a result here? Exactly. The football's great, but can we get a result? I think it's only one one way traffic for me this week and I'm going to go Hibs to win 2-0. 2-0? Two You've right just gone 2-0 every game, aye? <laughs> <laughs> I've went 2-0. You've went 2-0 every oh, game. Well. That's why I'm sitting up top of the league, because you have <laughs> to look at the league. league. That's right. That's because I've been holiday and I don't get a signal. <laughs> That's, That's not Rick's fault. <laughs> right, come on, look, Andy. I managed to post mine during an earthquake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's an excuse. Let me talk about some of the characters. Aye. Uh, how the hell do you sit down? How does the ice cream, I mean, of, of all, of all the, I mean, all my mates, you know, it's like, I mean, aye, aye. football guys are like, I've got Cam Dar Dan Barkman on the lap, and they're all texting me the best sketch and I'm like you don't need to tell me I know I, shut it I know. Right? how did that come about <laughs> um, so but I did remember so we did a read through which I was reading through all the scripts and we're sitting in the office and I remember it says do you know external show ice cream van comes in the corner ice cream vendor can uh, is handing the cones to the wee boys and say, which are we pal what and, he's, and whispers he's wanting a swatch your fanny <laughs> and then it's and it says <laughs> <laughs> and do you know it's funny it's, it's meant to be Squatch and any time if you watch it again you'll see the, the wee boy says Squatch so sometimes people say to me Squatch and I'm like ah, it's Squatch anyway it doesn't matter it doesn't matter um, and then it says the ice cream vendor lifts Scott up and I was like ah, what is this what are you doing here what am I doing and we're like don't worry we'll shout cut it's just put your horns on the skirt and if you see it that's what happens yeah. the skirt. and I'm like ah, right alright but where's the beans? And I don't know, the shit cutting everything. <laughs> well, there was a line in it, and they were like, the, 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 so the censors allowed us to put it through, but they were like, you need to take that last line out. And the last line in it was, she pulls back to her skirt and leans over and says to me, boys, do you want a flake in that? <laughs> okay, there was a great player who sadly passed away uh, in Sir Bobby Charlton. And I think for those of a certain vintage who were lucky enough to see him play um, uh, at his absolute peak, he was a very special player. And please don't be offended by the fact I'm looking towards um, you, first right. of all, to offer it to you. But um, from our so point lot. of view, black and white or even colour pictures of Bobby Charlton, I'm thinking to myself, you couldn't buy him for less than 150 million today. Oh yeah, but he was, and he was more than that as well. I mean, this much overused word icon, he was actually a template for a certain type of Englishman as mm. well. 
Um, he obviously very working class backgrounds, but very sort of dignified. And yeah, I gave him, um, he got booked against Argentina, I think the '66 World Cup, and that was about it. Uh, I, I had uh, I was asked to write a piece about him this week for the Mail, and and and, and immediately it was about how he they wanted me on to you know Sir Bobby in Scotland, and and I'd went down to uh, Manchester and interviewed him once which was one of the great days of my life, not just my working life, my life, you know, going for a man of my age, going in, into Bobby Charlton's office and, and, and interviewing him. And the interview finishing, Peter, shaking the hand of your interview subject in the shadow of his own statue. You don't do that often, do <laughs> no, you? No, absolutely not. You don't do that often. And uh, uh, he was quite um, terse with me to begin with. Um, he said, remember, you're only at 20 minutes here. I said, yeah, and on that note, so I'll tell you what I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you anything about your Manchester United career, World Cup, or Munich. And his face relaxed. He said, what are you going to ask me about? He said, I'm only just going to ask you about Scotland. You you know, what Scotland means to you. An hour later, <laughs> we're still chatting. The people were knocking at his door, Sir Bobby, somebody's waiting for you here. He just went on and on about Scotland, because you've got to remember the Matt Busby connection, mm -hmm. Paddy Crerand, um, uh, Dennis... Um, uh, Fergie eventually as well. He used to go to the Scottish Cup final instead of the English final when he was a kid because it was nearer. Hamden was nearer than Wembley. You forget these things. Um, he scored his debut goal at Hamden. He was just story after story after story. Just an absolute gem of a man telling the story. Very quiet. And uh, I've got one wee story. I'll finish. I'm raving on about him, but it was such a great day. I always remember they used to talk uh, great about Bobby Lennox. I always liked Bobby Lennox because he played for Celtic in a testimonial match with Lennox up front. And Lennox had played as a striker that day. And he was just unplayable, you know, Bobby Charlton threading balls through to him, Lennox's speed. And I said, what about Bobby Lennox? He said, Bobby Lennox was the best centre forward I ever played with. And I said, so Bobby, you played with a centre forward that scored a hat-trick in a World Cup final. And he burst it off. Bobby Lennox was the best Scottish. <laughs> I said, so Bobby, you played with Dennis Law. <laughs> Bobby Lennox was a great player. <laughs> uh, so that, it was just, uh, it was just, but it's impossible, I think, now for people to realise what what Bobby Chant would, would have meant to our generation in that we're talking about chance now and we're talking about booze and things like that. Uh, and the Scotland-England game was a hugely febrile atmosphere. The Wembley was packed with Scots fans, as you know. I can never remember Charlton being booed or even like um, uh, derogatory chant towards yeah. him at the end. It was just a feeling that kind of, well, this is a player. This yeah. is a player. And the funny thing about it, you know, I, I love the makeup of different people with their personalities. I, you know what I'm like, John, I love a noise up. Um, but I, I equally is looking at me. <laughs> I don't even need to tell him. I love a noise up. But I do, I do love players who are so good yeah. that they project humility in abundance. And that's, I mean, he, he, he reminded me, you know, of many, many great players who didn't want to brag. Yeah. You know, it was just that was part of his makeup. When you look at the his scoring record, I mean, it was approximately one goal and three for a midfielder throughout his career, you know, at, at club and international level. Extraordinary. And I've obviously not seen all of his goals, and I'm sure he scored a few tappings, but how many yeah, of his goals were just absolute that. missiles, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. If there was a cleaner striker of a football, mm. I'm not sure I've seen him, you know? It's just like, and you look at the, the pitches these, uh, back in those days and the kind of the, the balls themselves, you know? And... Uh, just um, you know, extraordinary uh, you know scorer of, of great goals, you know, as well as a, as a prolific goal scorer as well. But um, I mean, do, do you think it would, would it be strange to think? I was just thinking that the whole kind of history of Man United, you know, I'm trying to think apart from uh, Matt Busby and Alec Ferguson, I think there's an argument to say Bobby Charlton is you know perhaps the the the, the third most influential figure in the, the kind of history mm. of the club, given his playing career, given the fact he was a director. Absolutely. From eighty four onwards, and, and was a, obviously played for Busby, mm. but was a confidant of, of Sir Alec as well. I mean, his his influence over the, the years, you know, going way back to the, the, the Munich year crash and all that. It's just it's it's, it's almost impossible to quantify. Yeah. Exactly, this is a guy when you you you, you quantify his career. It's a guy who eleven was 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 uh, 
was getting headhunted by all the top teams in England. They went to Manchester United, who weren't by any manner of means a top team in the fifties. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and went there, and then he lives his life. He gets catapulted out an aeroplane in his seat for forty yards, and wakes up sitting in his uh, his aeroplane seat in the, in the middle of a ice strewn runway with the bodies of his greatest mates strewn about him, comes back from that, three months later, three months later, makes his debut against Scotland, scores from 30 yards, and then through his life he wins everything. He wins the Ballon d'Or, he wins a World Cup, he wins a European Cup, he wins a league, he wins an FA Cup. There is nothing that can be ticked off it. And all the time, Peter, can you imagine what we would be saying now? In those times, it was just, ah, you were in a plane crash, go yeah. on with it. The trauma on Can you imagine, it? you know, and, and, the, and probably the untreated mm -hmm. trauma that that guy <laughs> suffered from mm -hmm. 1958, 57-58, uh, Till, till he died. Well, this epitomises the humility of the man, Alison, because if you watch countless interviews, he, he is at that on the edge talking about Munich because he feels, you know, why why me? Mm -hmm. why, why was I allowed to I live? I think it's a very natural reaction. I think, uh, I think if he did survive something like that, I think it's a very powerful and pervasive. I, I'm not sure you would ever lose that. I don't know if maybe it... it for some people it might be a driver, mm -hmm. you know, I'm here and I feel as though I've got a great responsibility to live my life and, and to do everything to the fullest of my potential because I came so close to death and I've seen the fragility of life. Um, I don't know, I, I, I've never been in that situation, I can only surmise, but I think now with the education that even the likes of you and I would have of, of this kind, these kind of circumstances, it just didn't exist. Back then, the, the sort of post-traumatic shock that he would have suffered. He was playing. You, you he wouldn't. Was out of hospital and playing. It, it, yeah, a it's month incredible. later. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. But um, the one thing I had never truly appreciated the fallout between um, Bobby and Jack. Mm -hmm. I, I hadn't realised just how bitter it was and how long it had lasted, which I think would be one of your real. I think that's the one thing that you would say would be regrettable. About yeah. his life. We could do a whole we could do a whole program on oh. families falling out. Oh. Um, yeah. But he was a wonderful player. Um, and again, if you get a chance, and I, I offer this to the younger generation to go on YouTube, put in Bobby Charlton because <clears throat> if you listen to the commentary, I always think it's great because <laughs> he hits one with his left, and then you'll hear another commentary going, "Oh my, it's coming to his right foot," yeah. and you're thinking, "What foot did he hit with?" Because oh. every one of them from either foot was a screamer. <laughs> It's almost a fairy tale story, but a really dark fairy tale mm. too, because there is that stuff about um, uh, there is that stuff about Jack. There is Munich. There's also the turmoil when he was playing at Manchester United with players in the dressing room. There wasn't a team that that really got on that well together because all stars, etc., etc. Fall out with Best, for example. Uh, and the one really interesting thing about it, probably his most important goal, all these screamers, he scored with his head. Right, it was the first goal against Benfica in the European Cup final, which was such a grail for Busby mm. and the Manchester United team. And he scored a header. And I watched Charlton, I was brought up, I'm heading rapidly towards 70, but I was trying to think, can I ever remember him scoring another? He probably obviously mm. has scored another goal in his head. That's the only so header that I can remember him scoring. And it was the goal that opened the scoring against Benfica. Yeah, um, I think there might have been one against Scotland. Yeah. as well. I, I watched them specifically the other day there, and, and uh, you're right, it absolutely is real. Um, but one thing you can say is um, he certainly has his place among the Man United greats. You know, you've talked about uh, Sir Alex saying you like the team, and then everybody goes, ah, but have you seen his Walter Smith interview? Now, I watched that Walter Smith uh, video, and I know what you're trying to say. No, but let me let me tell you, because people go and go to, and the story's too long, and I'm trying to abbreviate it. Can I just say that, to, just to pre preface the story, you and Walter are pals. Yes, yes, close, very close. Right, right. so... Many lengthy lunches, you know. Um, you used to have a Thursday club, didn't you? Yeah, uh, starting a Tuesday, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so the pals, and I'm, you know, so it's 1993, I'm probably the peak of my declining years. <laughs> uh, and it's, um, they lose the game to EK. And I get down, and I knew he's been in a furious mood, so I, I, the, the BBC sent me with a camera to Ibrox, and Laura, the wonderful secretary, she's a woman who, who could tell a million stories, but Laura, he said, he'll not see you. And apparently, I only find this out later, from Walter's perspective, 
he, she says, Chick's waiting, tell me, go away. Yes. And uh, she said, oh, no, go away, I'll wait. And, and Walter said, oh, I knew you would. So he said, to set up the tunnel. So the, the, the rest is history. I set up the tunnel and, and, and he doesn't like the question. <laughs> and I was, so the, the, Which was about Basil Bolly. This bit, the bit, the, yeah, it was about, and I had said before that, he said, Basil Bolly is one of European, what do you mean, he's won a Champions League, he's won a European Cup. I said, I think I said something, this is where it went wrong, something like, so is Tommy Gemmell, but he's not getting into your team now, is he? <laughs> and that was maybe, and Walter, as, as you know, Peter, it had, it was a stare. Oof. <laughs> you didn't have to say it was a stare. Uh, and you can you can beep this if you like, yeah, but Walter yeah. had a fuck off and a fuck <laughs> off, and you had to know the difference, right? So he, anyway, don't I worry, you're allowed to swear on this program. It gives me the it gives me the second version, uh, and the, of course the infamous thing where it's a guy called Billy Frews, the cameraman who's sadly no longer with us, with, with us. and there's that lovely bit because it's for frame shooting down the tunnel, and Walter turns round to Archie Knox and says, Archie, we heard his questions. And Archie, you know, tell me to stick the mic. <laughs> and, 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 and Billy's absolutely, it's so mad, <laughs> pissing ourselves laughing. And that's why you see the camera move. And, and Walter says, no wonder you're laughing, Billy. Um, so I, get, I had to keep going, you know, because although I've just sworn in these days, you, you, you know, they would now, you would now actually use a manager swearing, but yeah. he, he knew then we wouldn't use it. But eventually I got whatever I needed, 25 cent clip for Report in Scotland. Uh, go back to the studio, we do put the piece together, that's fine. And in these days, this is the point of my story, it's it's tapes, right? it's good old fashioned tapes, it's none of this digital stuff. And they used to recycle them, it's a big thing, bin you threw them in. Yeah. And I thought, no, I'm keeping that. And I kept that in my drawer. And that Christmas, he used to get a memo, this is for <laughs> emails, a memo around, is anyone get any outtakes we can use? Aye, I've got this me and Walter. So the point of the story is, that would never, I could have buried that. Absolutely. It was me that preserved it. Yeah. And then I get, I got the next, I, this is the thing I remember, I was in Marseille and I got a call um, from the News of the World saying, look, there's this VHS going round, grainy VHS going round pubs, and they're showing you and what. So I have to explain the stories, I've just told it to you. <laughs> the News of the World ran the story pretty fairly. Yeah. Uh, and then another 10 years go by, and I always remember this, News of the World again, I'm still in, I'm in Marseille again, bizarrely, and the guy goes, there's this, it's on YouTube, and before you go any further, I said to the boy, before you go any further, what the fuck is YouTube? <laughs> so he has to explain to me what YouTube is, and I yeah. go through the whole story, how the news of all 10 years, it was, it was VHS copies and pubs, this was... This was getting. This was now on YouTube and find out. So I then go and tell Walter. Walter says, well, same question as you will know, Paris. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm now full of knowledge of it. What you talk about? Well, this is YouTube. Uh, he says, that's interesting. He says, uh, he says to me, that's I got a pound. At this time, there's a million people had watched it. Absolutely. He said, I said, I got a pound. I, I didn't even know they were called hits. Yeah. At that time, he says, we could, that's a million pounds, we could give that a charity. Yeah. To which I said, Walter, you can do what you want with your half. I'm taking <laughs> half a million. <laughs> <laughs> but I was well, well, no, not a penny was forthcoming, and all the rights actually belong at the BBC. But but that, I don't know how many million people have watched that now. But that is the there you are. That's the full, unexpurgated story of how it came to pass. And and oh, the final one before, and he, as as you know, he was a great man, great lunch. And one of the ones last lunches we had, he said to me, "I wish I'd never done that. I wish I'd never sworn at you." I said, "Oh, really?" He said, "Why not?" He says, uh, "The granddaughter was." Uh, has now worked out to work computers and she stumbled across the interview and she said to him, Grandpa, why are you swearing at that nice man? Is that right? Just <laughs> so feel like, I go back to what you bought her. Yeah, well, I know, exactly. <laughs> this is for the draw if you get it and for the win if you get it. Right, ready? Is there a tie break? No. No. No tie break. Just crap. <laughs> well, why be better. Why would you want a draw? <laughs> what at the start? Right, final question. What was the final aggregate score between Hibs and Aston Villa? 8-0. McGinn was the one that we got through the net absolutely, yeah. but I think Dolt, I think see once Liverpool came in and said Aye. and Klopp was making calls and all that and you Klopp was like, See now this is a change change. Well I always think the big big one was 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 Ryan Fraser, remember when he left Aberdeen? Yeah. And he was only 15, 16, and, and, and I talked to the late Craig Brown about it. And he says it's very difficult to talk to, to, to players when this when 
that generation when you say English Premier League because that's, right yeah. that's where they want to go to when they're 25 <laughs> yep. they're saying oh that's the journey and then suddenly at 15 somebody's saying to them you can come to Liverpool yeah. under Klopp and by the way I don't know what Liverpool are paying, are paying them but they, I think it'll be decent yeah. the thing is uh, the, when players are only a few years before that when they start getting interest it was probably a Premier League shirt they were wearing as they were running about uh, playing yeah. football you know uh, another the thing as well we, we, the thing we don't, 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 don't come on in a, a Celtic Rangers game Aye. Yeah. So you got his. Ch I mean, I think they were saying if you stay here, we'll give you a chance. I think it was just. Yeah. I I, I know what you're getting that with you know players going and that McGinn was a big loss for Celtic, but I just think seeing the more I hear about the dog thing and I'm trying to write something about them now, the more and more it was seemed that it was. Yeah. I said to her, why why do you hate the Lisbon Lions? <laughs> she said, because they ruined our holiday. <laughs> what are you what are you talking about? They ruined a holiday to Sri Lanka, they bombed the airport. That's the Tamil Tigers, you dozy <laughs> bastard. See when he was talking about how oh, it has games mm. you turn, when you run out there, you know, and you the atmosphere. What minute was it when you came out? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, and I stayed in the vid and said, uh, but the other reason I wanted to come tonight is I love Brendan Rodgers. He's a, to me a superhero. Huh? Uh, and this is also a big roar because he was, there was, it was the, the first wave, right? Um, more than 100 points, way! More than 100 goals, way! Invincible for the season, way! But more than any of those reasons, the reason he's a superhero is he's the only human to kiss Lee Griffiths and no get pregnant. Right? <laughs> I thought it was an okay joke. A minute. Is that right? A minute. I had to stand there and wait for him to finish, right? Oh, no. Can't get it out of it. He's kind of got false teeth on <laughs> I always say that uh, Pep Guardiola killed me. In, to, in the sense of how things were played. It was great, obviously, later in my career, I moved down to England after I left Celtic. I had to change, I had to evolve. I had to play in different roles, whether it was playing out wide left of a three or in a 10 or, or even playing in two eights. Um, that helped me learn a lot more about the game and probably has helped me now, uh, more so than if I had just played and stayed as a nine um, throughout my career. But the little and large has gone. However, I think we're seeing now more so uh, fashionably a lot more teams playing 4-4-2 again you know so it is slightly coming back uh, but there's so much work to be done in terms of developing now the next generation of goal scorers and wanting to be a goal scorer because a lot of period for probably the last decade or 15 years kids always want to be Lionel Messi they want to be that number 10 in the pockets but we're even seeing now that's that trend's coming out of the game and it's more playing with two eights that go higher and pin high and you have the one striker that becomes the false nine and comes in and, and plays off plays off in those spaces so um, it's going to be interesting to see how that now develops and even wingers are coming back into the game that was one of the evident things talking to the Premier League teams that they want ball carriers 1v1 players getting at players which Celtic have had in recent years and had success. In nine weeks Clement seems to have galvanised Rangers in nine weeks Brendan Rodgers seems to have dismantled Celtic. Yeah it's been an incredible turnaround to be honest with you I think when you know, Michael Beale left and Clement came in. I think if you'd have said a week before Christmas that, you know, Rangers would have won the League Cup and be, have a, po a possibility to be above Celtic before that game, you know, at, at Celtic Park, you'd have took you to your stairs, to be honest. I don't think anyone's seen it coming. When we used to do the stage shows of it, uh, we, were all, we would always finish with Frank McIverney uh, because you couldn't top that. And, uh, I mean, you, I come out. You, you would work in such a way that I could get off stage, get the leg on, the teeth on, jacket on, and then on. And oh, the the laughs you just, you just you'd stand for ages. Just <laughs> look, the, if you could pick a good looking girl in the front row, you're away. You get mileage out of that. It was honestly, it was such a gift. Yeah, uh, it was great. He 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 uh, he seemingly says to this day that he ne he's never said where's the birds, but that is not true. <laughs> Because uh, I was telling this story recently, uh, there used to be a wee guy who worked in the BBC called Andy Hutton, a big Celtic fan, a great wee guy, and uh, Andy Hutton came in one day and said to me and Phil, he said, I was in Baird's Bar, uh, it was some morning, it was like a Sunday morning or something like that, and he said, uh, Frank McIverney walked in, and he walked in, he looked about, and he said to the bar, and he went, where's the birds? <laughs> And we couldn't believe it. Whether well, maybe can't remember saying it, but he definitely said it. So we play Rangers in the, the semi-final, and the whole week build up to that week. 
my dad's like, ah, you get a penalty, you better blast it. You better blast it. You better not place it again, right? So, <laughs> so it's three each in penalties. So you're dashed, eh? right? It's it's blast, right. So it's three each and I'm walking towards the Rangers fans. Right? We're All taking right. it in front of them and I'm getting oh, there's a booze or the crescendo, right? <laughs> So I goes up and I'm walking up to this boy and I just think, my dad told me to bust it. Right? So I goes up, right? I, 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 honestly, Jig, it's on YouTube, right? I absolutely lashed it, right? And Stefan Klaus knew I was going to lash it, right? So he stood, and before he could even get his horn up, it was in the net, right? It was, a, it was the hardest shot I've ever hit. And see if it never hit the net, it would have cleared the stand at him. It would have took a big runny and just bloated it and went in. And then we beat Frank the Bournemouth to penalty and we beat Rangers. So that was probably mine. Uh, I'll kind of ease us into it. Um, sports games, um, you know, it's incredible because obviously the big one, the talking point at the moment is that FIFA, uh, which is a huge sports game, is changing the brand and the name and they reckon if you change the name, you, you're in danger of maybe alienating your audience and, you know, it could actually drop the sales. And it brought to mind to me, Wow, sports games, what were the games that I loved when I was a kid, you know, that we got top five. I've given you five, see if you can come up with some others, Tam. Yeah. Uh, Sabutio was massive. Mm. You know, my mum cut out a solid cardboard and then stuck the mm -hmm. green felt on it and then laid it out on the floor, um, which was brilliant until my sister stood on my Dundee United players. <laughs> I stood on my oh, brother's yeah. Maradona. Did you? Well, that's <laughs> that's outrageous. Well, mate, Gary's uh, cat was rushed to the vet after swallowing one of the wee men. Oh, yeah. uh, was that dangerous? Cats would just go for stuff like that, you know? <laughs> that's, I'm, getting, I'm getting flashbacks here. Yeah, this were you, is awful. Were you a Sabutio man, Michael? Oh, very much so, yeah. If I remember, remember my brother and I played Sabutio when a fight break out, my dad ran into to smack two of us and ran across the whole pitch and broke every single player in the park. Everyone was in tears. That's why he smacked. That's why he knew when the pals had money because if you were lucky enough just to get the like the bat looked like you've whipped it off a snooker table, the bat of beige, right? That yeah. was one thing. But you knew the pals that had money when they had like the floodlights. Oh, oh the stand, the stand, the stand oh, with the oh, people oh, in it. Oh, yeah, I had. Uh, I, I don't think striker was better though. Super striker, uh, and you had the heat, oh, and it kicked him. Well, that yeah. was much better than all that. That was shove eight, me. It's a beauty. Of I wish I'd kept super striker um, because, as you know, Michael, it's a lucrative game now. I mean, anyone who's got a 1977 Luke Skywalker is in for a few quid. All but right. you know, if you had super striker or the original Sabuto. People pay lots of money. eBay quids in, yeah. Unfortunately, mine was all trash from my dad kicking lots of them. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, that's Skywalker went as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you went the same way. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't actually buy any of the Star Wars gear, but nevertheless, uh, Sabuto, Super Striker, uh, Ali. Do you want to add to it? Can you think of anything? I remember one year we got a uh, table tennis bats in a net that you could like <laughs> redesign your yeah. kitchen table, so you put the net oh, across right, the table right. and um, yeah. It's various ornaments smashed in our house. You had a kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> you had a kitchen? The poverty we grew up with. Oh, <laughs> just amazing. <laughs> That's fantastic. And room to take your backhand. Right. Um, no, no, I, I get that. I mean, I, listen, it's funny you saying that because there's some kids now who actually get the table tennis table. I know. And they can play it no problem and they look at you as if you're completely and utterly insane. I remember one year my brother got my snooker table. My brother got a oh. snooker table and um trying to do a trick shot, he put the ball through the front window. <laughs> 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 right, what was the purpose of the trick shot? Was, it, was that part of it? No. I remember no. the sweet hole in the front window. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, oh. That was another one, frankly, when you, because Sim used to get a, a, a Bring it back to memories now, but when your your mum would get the big Christmas catalogue delivered. <laughs> yeah. Now, honestly, leaving all the pervy stuff aside, you went straight to the toys and you would always see just what looked like a great six by three snooker table. Yeah. But it was way you'd look at the price, you'd think, oh well, you know, can I just, £99 pound or something. Can I just say something to you? Because as you know, I come from a huge family, Michael. Um this is how this is how poor we were. <laughs> we used to have a game where we'd all sit around the catalogue and you were allowed one choice on each page and you oh, go out right. and bags that and then bags that you were never get explained that year you get the girdle <laughs> Still <laughs> got it's on eBay, <laughs> but you never, we never got them. You were just yeah. you kidded yeah. on. You were picking them. But you were, in your fantasies. Yeah, absolutely. You never got the chance. Anyway, Nintendo Wii was another one when it, mm. it, it broke the boundaries. Yeah, of, whoa, whoa, whoa! Can we see your birth certificate? <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo Wii. What was yeah. when you were a kid? No, 
No, but I'm just saying that's well. It's, it's, it's not, not spe- just a spectrum ZX. Like exactly. I'm, I'm giving you a generation and a generation. I'm giving you a generation and a generation. I'm giving you 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 a generation. I
<clears throat> I'm not facing this on my own, as it were, you know. So <clears throat> I feel as if the fixture has lost something. And um, I have had, in the last season, I've had some friends come to the game of matches and say, oh, it's a fantastic atmosphere, really great, but they've not seen the away fans. I said, but you won't have seen it when, when at Celtic Park, when yeah. the Rangers fans are there and, and uh, vice versa. So it has lost a little bit of something from, from, from the fixture. And as a, from a managerial viewpoint, going to Ibrox, you felt, honestly, at least if you've got somebody with you there to, to help you along, even though you actually genuinely know that you're probably on your own. Yeah. So uh, no uh, Rangers fans this weekend? No Rangers fans. Uh, and, 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 the, and the point here, which I think Martin <clears throat> put across so succinctly there, is quite simply that the fixture, well... It may not be one of the greatest derbies in the world, technically at times. Um, certainly you can get the excitement. Mm -hmm. But the real attraction of it was the history. Mm -hmm. And it was that feeling, certainly when we were sitting in the press box, there was that sense of, there's 7,000 Rangers fans, there's 7,000 Celtic fans in a away game, and you got the cackle of it. Five minutes before the two teams came out, you guys probably wouldn't have been privy to this, but five to six minutes before every old film game I've ever covered, it's almost as if that spinal tap moment mm -hmm. where he turns it up to 11 uh -huh. and the place yeah. just goes yes. bananas. Yes. And it, the noise was unbelievable. And they are going at each other, albeit sometimes the poison doesn't uh, sit well with me. But the, there were times yeah. when the atmosphere was unbelievable. I think it should change, do you? Obviously, honestly, I was at the um, first game of the season. The mm. Rangers played Celtic. And when Celtic scored, it was almost like, um, you know, we, we were in a time warp. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Everything yeah. went really yeah. quiet, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. no Celtic fans cheering, yeah. Rangers fans like stunned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm saying, was it a goal that they gave it? Mm -hmm. Or you know, yeah, that's it's, true. That's, it, time stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost it's time to yeah. change though, isn't it? Go back to what ah, yeah, come on, get the fans back. The period that you two were in charge, that was the most exciting period for Rangers and Celtic head to head. I, I, I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. And give Alex his uh, real great credit because he had managed Hibs as well, to have taken Hibs to a uh, cup final the year 2000-2001, th uh, and, um, and we won, but we would be expected to win because we had a stronger side than that there. And then he, he, he comes and, um, and starts to ruin my domination. <laughs> honestly, uh, great times. I honestly think that the sides were really packed even, with really evenly quality players. Absolutely yeah. quality players all over the pitch and, and big games. And you, f you, you were nervous beforehand. You were nervous during the games. And actually, you were probably pretty nervous after the matches were over. But um, no, great, great days, of course.